לא אסמס, הוא אוצר עצמאי והוא כותב באומן. הוא מלמד אמנות באוניברסיטת SMU, וכותב דוקטורט במחלקה לתולדות האמנות באוניברסיטת טקסס באוסטין, טקסס. הוא שימש שם בעבר אוצר במרכז לאמנות חזותית, בין 2010 ל-2011. אני אמנה כמה מהפרויקטים מהאוצרותיים שלו. התערוכה יורי's אופיס של איפסוס מנגה רופוס קורפוריישן בפורט וורט קונטמפרי ארטס, התערוכה של תמי בנטו בטסט סייט באוסטין, התערוכה אאוט אוף פלייס בגלריה לורה ריינולדס באוסטין, שכללה גם עבודות של דן פיחי, אברטנה, עודד הירש, בין השאר, התערוכה קוויר סטייטס במרכז לאמנות חזותית באוניברסיטת טקסס, ככותב החיבורים האחרונים שלו כללו את המאמר uh, Setting Sale, The Aesthetics of Politics on the Gaza Flotilla, uh, ראיונות עם אמנים ג'יל מגד, וואלי בשטי ואחרים, למגזין Art Papers, ואני אזכיר רק את החיבור האחרון, uh, the, art of, the Art of Forgetfulness, The Trauma of Memory, יעל ברטנה and Arthur Chmievsky's Transmission Annual, right? I was asked to talk about uh, the meaning of freedom <coughs> in cultural production, and um, I'm going to try to bring together a bunch of different things, um, and I'm going to start with um, uh, a magazine uh, that I, uh, Art Lies magazine that was based in, uh, in Texas for about 10 years. Um, I was on the editorial board for um, a while, and um, was a guest editor of this um, uh, edition of it in 2007 that was based on uh, collectivism. So um, one of the things about collectivism um, that I think can help us think about the question about freedom in relationship to artists versus curators is this question of collaboration, right? Like what happens um, when one works with another um, and also what happens in relationship to questions of authorship. So freedom, in a lot of ways I'm going to be rehearsing things that I'm sure everyone knows but I think might be helpful for us to kind of inform the conversation. So freedom is something that within the avant-garde um, was very much tied to a question of agency, right? Um, um, the artistic expression of oneself, um, you know, as opposed to the constraints of the self through some kind of uh, objectivity. Um, that in some ways by not fixing meaning for the other, by the uh, Fix, the artist not fixing meaning for the audience, for the viewer, then in some ways the, uh, the artist was more free to express their self. This at least was one of the premises of, of uh, the avant-garde. Um, so, uh, but the avant-garde was also about pushing against boundaries. Um, and there are a number of different boundaries that could be pushed against. Um, so Duchamp, for instance, with the Creative Act, talked about um, the artist, the artwork, and the spectator um, as uh, sort of transmitting meaning in a much more fluid way, so that it wasn't fixed necessarily within uh, the artist, wasn't fixed necessarily through the object itself, but in some ways the viewer completed a cycle and opened up yet another cycle of the way that meaning could be transmitted. Um, the question of authorship was brought up by people like Benjamin and Barth. Um, Barth uh, famously with the death of the author, um, the potential birth of the reader, echoing um, the argument with, of Duchamp's with the creative act. Also with uh, Benjamin's essay, The Author as Producer, who, where basically he, he talked about the, um, uh, the removal uh, of the objective individual and activating uh, the author as some, some, someone who could participate within a collective, right? So uh, this is like removing a singular author and potentially could lead to the possibility of collaboration and collectivism. So this issue was um, premised on some of these, uh, these ideas. Um, I worked on it with Michelle White, who's a curator at the Menil Foundation in Houston. Um, we were both uh, uh, working on simultaneous projects that had to do with collectivism. Um, I was working on a show called Collecting and Collectivity um, that was actually part of um, an, an exhibition, a symposium. We did a graduate seminar, uh, a panel at the College Art Association. Um, there were a number of different parts to the whole thing, but the exhibition um, portion um, had one major part, which was this uh, mural um, on the right that's a version of it that actually was at Secession in Vienna. Um, uh, by Julie Alton Martin Beck about the poverty line. And then on the left is a group, um, LTTR, 
um, which uh, Lesbians to the Rescue, um, and we brought Kate Hardy, who was uh, one of the uh, members of this uh, collectivist organization, um, to talk about uh, her work in that collective. So Michelle was working on a show at the Manil uh, in which they had invited uh, this artist collective, Odubanga Jones and Associates. Um, that's Odubanga Jones and Associates there on the left. Um, it's a group of uh, African-American uh, artists um, that are based in Houston. They um, showed the Whitney Biennial and a number of other exhibitions. And they were invited to mine the museum, right? To go to the um, Mineo collection and look through um, this famous trove of um, sort of modernist artifacts, but also um, to look at the history of the Menils as being very much invested in not just the history of abstraction, but also the history of civil rights. Um, so the exhibition was putting together um, Basically, them as, an, as a collective were curating an exhibition within the museum of this, of this collection that was about both art and activism in a lot of ways. Um, Odebenga Jones, by the way, uh, doesn't really exist as a person. That, um, that person in the hoodie over there is the sort of invisible, fictional uh, leader of the collective. Um, so one of the exhibitions that we were very much influenced by was um, Group Materials um, Democracy Project. Um, the the Odebanga Jones show was premised not just on setting up these objects, um, art objects and artifacts, but also holding it as a classroom. Uh, they invited uh, Amiri Baraka, who's this famous um, poet and civil rights activist, um, who gave a session. Um, and uh, the, and and for me, my connection with, um, with Group Material was Julie All. Julie um, was one of the main um, founders and workers within um, Group Material, and she recently published a book um, about the history of that. And one of the things that, that is, is interesting about this book, um, about the history of Group Material, is that she shows the documents of all of their um, co internal conversations, which were very, very wrought with conflict. Um, so uh, in a way, collectivism, on the one hand, sort of points to a certain kind of freedom, a freedom that, is, um, that seems to sort of remove the boundaries in the avant-garde sense between sort of um, individual authorial um, genius. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, fr the freedom of collectivism leads to an enormous amount of conflict and tension. Um, and the, this publication was sort of revealing that fact. Um, okay, so um, another, oh, another example that we were thinking a lot about was um, Martha Rosler's project, um, If You Lived Here, um, which also was shown at DIA um, just a year before. Um, and this, interestingly enough, is, um, is cited by Anton Vindokle as being sort of a foundational exhibition for him and his practice. Um, then, um, uh, there's Orchard, which is a, an artist collective that was based in, in uh, the Lower East Side in New York from 2005 to 2008. Um, and uh, I first found out about um, Orchard because of Martin Beck, Julie Alt's um, professional partner, um, who had an exhibition there. Um, and uh, over here you can see uh, Andrea Fraser there on the left, who did a, um, a famous performance that she restaged in the space um, in an exhibition that had work by Alan McCollum and uh, Rebecca Quaitman and Lawrence Wiener. And she plays a, a docent, right? Someone who's sort of guiding visitors uh, through the exhibition for the entire run of the sort of eight-hour openings of the, of the exhibition. Um, and she, uh, she would say things like, this isn't art. It's a perversion of art. And this isn't culture. Where do they get their money? What does this have to do with my experience? <laughs> right, so in, in a way, like Andrea Fraser, so tied to institutional critique, was also sort of playing the role of the skeptical viewer, right? The viewer who is skeptical of these uh, avant-garde gestures, which are supposedly about the freedom of that viewer, and that viewer themselves sees them, th their freedom being constricted. And say, why do, you, why do you put this on me? I don't want this. Um, so, uh, anyway, that's Orchard. So, um, another issue uh, about a year later than our collectivism issue in Art Lies was um, entitled The Death of the Curator. Um, obviously referencing both the death of the author, um, but also referencing the potentiality of authorship in relationship to curatorial practice. Um, 
One of the um, interviews there was between Michelle White and Nato Thompson, um, uh, Michelle again who I'd worked with on the last issue, um, and uh, Nato Thompson of Creative Time. And uh, it was entitled Curator as Producer. So on the one hand, um, referencing the Benjamin, the Benjamin text, but on the other hand, um, referencing uh, Nato Thompson's uh, title at Creative Time at the time, which was not curator, it was producer. He was a producer in the sense of someone like a, a, a film producer who sort of organizes people around to create something to happen. Um, and one of the things that uh, Michelle was asking him about was the, the tension between um, the, the authorship of the artist versus the curator. And, um, and he says, you know, I'm not interested in this stupid like artist, curator, artist, curator. Who cares about that? What I care about is social capital. It's not about like who owns the meaning. It's about who's getting paid and who has the most power. That's what's most important. Um, another piece that was in there um, was, uh, by Jens Hoffman and, and Julieta Aranda. Um, and it was a conversation between them and it was called Artist Curating versus Curate, well, does not equal curating as art. Um, so Jens Hoffman talked a lot about the fact that he's often accused of creating exhibitions that, um, that he is acting like the artist and uh, Julieta Aranda is accused often as being an artist who acts like a curator. Um, and Hoffman, interestingly, basically said, well, you know, I'm not really an uh, art historian curator. I'm not a curatorial studies curator. I come from the theater. And the, in the theater, we don't have these problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a, um, a, a show that he did in, in Texas and at Art Pace, and it was called On the Road. So Jens Hoffman, um, this European curator who now uh, lives in uh, the Bay Area, um, the head curator at the Wattis Institute, um, did this show um, that was based on the famous Jack Kerouac novel um, about um, sort, of the, the, sort of the myth of American exceptionalism, the myth of freedom, beatniks, the, the wide open road. And he included a lot of things uh, by people like Ed Ruscha, John Baldessari, Catherine Opie, Andy Warhol about car culture, road culture. Um, but he also included a lot of other things. Um, you know, included some photographs of his own. Um, this is a, a photograph that he took on the left of a tumbleweed, you know, sort of the iconic idea of Texas and the West and Western movies. He curated a film series that was um, next to it that was all of these Western movies. And then on the right, um, you can see the, you know, quintessential open road. He also found a lot of things along the way, uh, uh, a Texan hat, you know, 10 gallon hat with these little labels that he, um, that he wrote, uh, wrote little epigrams like, this is something I found in this sweet little shop in Marfa. Um, and over, you know, I found this Lone Ranger flashlight. So these are things that he found or bought um, that he included in the exhibition as well. So similar to, in some ways to the Otomega Jones show where there's ephemera put together with artwork, right? Um, but rather than artist as curator putting together ephemera and artwork, this is curator as artist putting together ephemera and artwork. Um, and, and you can see that the, the design of the show included a lot of the sort of red, white, and blue of both America and Texas. The both flags have those colors. Um, you know, the, anyway. Um, so uh, another, alternate model of American freedom and authorship, um, just as a kind of context. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if you've heard, maybe you all know this story of um, the CIA funding exhibitions of abstract expressionism. Um, <laughs> uh, so in the, um, in the late 1940s, uh, there was um, uh, uh, an organization that was set up um, as the CIA was being developed. There were a lot of um, sort of left-leaning um, uh, intellectuals within the CIA as opposed to the FBI at the time um, that thought that culture could be used to basically advocate for um, American superiority and American freedom as opposed to um, the constraints of the Soviet Union. So they uh, put together exhibitions that traveled around the world, including New American Painting in 1958 and 1959. And these included works by Jackson Pollock, Robert Motherwell, Willem de Kooning, Mark Rothko, 
They were funded by the CIA through these shell corporations that then would donate money to um, very wealthy Americans like Nelson Rockefeller, who was famously on the board of MoMA, um, and also uh, Nelson Fleischmann, um, an American millionaire. And basically, the CIA would pay these people to then fund the exhibition so that they could go to places like the Tate. Um, and uh, this was supposed to be a way for American freedom to be spread throughout the world. Another way for American freedom to be spread throughout the world um, was through um, the Bush administration's war on terror. Um, um, and uh, uh, for, so for instance, um, in Bush's second inaugural address, um, he used the word freedom 49 times. Um, Freedom um, also became an issue as uh, France was um, very uh, worried about uh, the Iraqi invasion. And as a result, two Republican senators, as you guys might remember, um, declared that uh, in the state of Maryland, um, that French fries could no longer be called French fries. They must be called freedom fries. <laughs> Um, so freedom was something that was uniquely American and could not be French, actually, despite the similarities in our revolutions, um, but, um, and could be spread throughout the world. But as we know from this image, that uh, the sort of declarations of freedom were also fraught with some troubling consequences. Um, also recently, uh, there's been a lot of talk about freedom in relationship to the Obama administration um, about a number of things. One being um, gay marriage, especially with the health care laws. The, um, and just a few days ago, there was an article in Salon, uh, salon.com, that said basically the title of it was, uh, Why do conservatives hate freedom? Um, and, uh, and basically the, the argument was, OK, so like the, um, there's all these notions of freedom in relationship to uh, a right, um, American right uh, um, administration. But on the other hand, like how can they be opposing gay rights, w looking back to the, um, the history of civil rights, looking back to women's right to choose? And he ends by looking at um, uh, a quote from George Washington, which said, quote, a, theoratic, a theocratic or tribalist right that argues for public policies by invoking divine revelation to some ancient prophet, prophet or immemorial custom dating back to the gloomy age of ignorance and superstition is profoundly and radically un-American. So this was this writer, uh, Michael Lind, who was basically using George Washington as an argument against the right's notion of freedom. Another question of freedom. Um, uh, uh, was, as I'm sure everybody knows, was um, the, uh, the, the the question around freedom um, surrounding the Sharjah Biennial and the firing of Jack Persekian. Um, in some ways, the Sharjah Biennial sort of leading up to this point was uh, seemingly a model of the freedom inherent in globalization and neoliberalism, right? Um, we could have like big collectors and dealers and artists going from Art Dubai to uh, Sharjah. Um, but, uh, and at the same time, there were these rumblings of the Arab Spring, which were also sort of echoing notions of freedom, right? two slightly uh, opposing and possibly overlapping notions of freedom. Um, but uh, this piece, for instance, um, uh, um, that by an Algerian artist that basically was taking quotations that were deemed to be blasphemous was essentially the reasoning um, behind the firing of Jack Persekian. So in some ways, the, um, the, a similar kind of uh, um, conservative backlash that, um, that Michael Lind was referring to and, and quoting George Washington in relationship to um, sort of these opposing notions of freedom was also um, basically showed a rupture in the supposed freedoms of, of uh, neoliberalism. So I'm going to give one last example from a project that um, I did. Um, as Leah mentioned, um, I uh, I've worked primarily as an artist, um, but then for the past four or five years, have been doing a lot more curatorial um, projects, and um, and so for me, this question of like the artist's um, freedom versus a curator's freedom um, is uh, not so clearly defined, um, but at the same time, uh, potentially problematic. Um, so test site this uh, um, this space in Austin invited me to invite an artist. They're part of a, an umbrella organization called Fluent Collaborative, 
um, that is premised on the idea of uh, a curator inviting an artist to, in some sense, uh, collaborate on a project. So I invited um, Tammy Bentor um, to do a project. And this, um, this became a, a difficult process. Um, essentially, I, I, I invited her um, to do the project. I, told to, I basically showed her the links of past projects that other people had done. Um, like uh, Larry Rinder with Cliff Hanks and Mike Smith with Jay Sanders, um, sort of showing how that there were different models for uh, a way that sort of a, a solo exhibition could be instituted by um, this collaboration between a writer and artist. Um, and at first she said, fine. Um, but then she said, well, you know, I've recently been doing a lot more work um, that is not really mine, but is a collaboration between myself and my husband, Mickey Carmi. So the truth is, is that I don't really make my own work. So for you to invite me is really for you to invite both of us. So, um, so I said, OK, well, let's see what we can do. You know, this is a tiny nonprofit, <laughs> very small budget. But we, I said, OK, well, we can cover certain fees, but we can't cover other fees. But we might be able to find a way to ship the work. So I was working with her to find a way to do this. And uh, she got frustrated with the lack of uh, funding and basically said, you know what, forget it. I'll just do one video. And I'm going to show you that video. <laughs> Plays a character who is, uh, as she describes it, is a kind of um, uh, the, um, a send up of the, the conceptual, social practice, performative artist who writes a lot of grants in order to travel to places, in order to get other people to make her work, um, and in order to write more grants to travel to other places, in order to get other people to make her work. Um, so essentially, the, it's this idea of the kind of gray, sad artist as clerk who uses the kind of openness of authorship and participation, sort of rhetorics of free in order to do very little labor and, um, and uh, to amass more and more social capital, and real capital, and travel around the world. Um, so uh, that's her, her premise. And this is the character who stays there basically throughout 10 minutes, just sort of stating these things in constant contradictions. So um, uh, you know, the next step, once she agreed to do this video installation, we also did a, a set of performances um, that she uh, didn't want us to document, so I can't show you those. Um, but um, the next question was, OK, well, what am I going to write about this? I was supposed to, as the curator, basically have some kind of text. And I went through all of the press releases from her gallery in New York, Zach Four, and, and basically too late realized that almost all of them um, function like this. The uh, Zach Four Gallery is pleased to present the work of Tammy Bentor, the artist states. And then there's a long quote. And then, thank you, we'll see you at the opening. <laughs> every, single, every single press release. Um, so I came to realize that um, she's not so happy with any kind of standard interpretive or descriptive model for any exhibition that might happen. Uh, so I said, well, you know, also in the spirit of Test Site and Fluent Collaborative, Maybe we come up with a creative model. Why don't I um, create a fictional character that will write a letter, a kind of fan letter, to the character that you're playing in the video? She said, you know what? I think that's good. That's more in the spirit of the freedom that I possess as an artist. <laughs> so um, I'm going to uh, read you uh, the, the text that I wrote to her, um, which might give you a sense of what her, because it really is a mirror of what her performance was. Um, Dear artist, uh, I happened upon a critique, or maybe it was a lecture, in which you were presenting some incredibly provocative ideas. And I was so taken by your work that I couldn't help myself but write this letter. It seems as though your interest in perception and reception opens up the possibility of various situations of response. So it seemed appropriate that I replied to the implicit invitation. But at first, a little about myself. I am a cultural practitioner interested in and fascinated by the mechanisms of research. My, my practice is best described as an audience member schooled in the act of viewership as participation. Some might call it judgment, but I prefer to call it radical critique. I am a writer and a curator and often give out unsolicited advice. This advice has a tendency to rise up from within me as an act of expression, frequently from situations of boredom, something that you seem to be fascinated by, right? 
you seem to have traveled to so many places. China, Morocco, Indonesia, Europe, and Australia are all places that I'd like to visit, too. Would it be possible for me to borrow from the verbiage of your grant applications? I know that my work isn't that of an artist, but since you seem to be so dedicated to maintaining no particular point of view at all, allowing for freedom of creativity, then if I were to appropriate the language that you use for these grants, then I would only be extending the freedom that your work is all about. I know that I'm not a gay, handicapped Israeli-Palestinian such as yourself, but I am sure that I could come up with something that would make me attractive. The grant that I'm working on is an investigation of your investigation. It will be about the affect inherent in time and space, the time that it takes to fill the space of a page with words that can generate possibilities of income. <laughs> After all, isn't income nothing more than an abstract category of potential? <laughs> in this sense, an investigation of appropriated time and space would allow me to experience firsthand terms like globalization, neoliberalism, and the politics of post-Fordism. Wouldn't that be a great thing for us to collaborate on? It would be a grant that will be an artwork that will be a response to arbitrary categories of authorship. Do you have any shows coming up? If so, I'd like to talk to you about your gallery. Sincerely, Dr. Nisim Hospet. <laughs> Talking about your work with uh, Michelle White, the mm -hmm. Foundation, um, and you were saying how it was an exhibition, a symposium, and a graduate seminar, mm -hmm. and it was uh, sort of almost multimedia, the way that artists today often work in many media. Right. Um, I was wondering if you think that the, the title curator is maybe too um, too small for for uh, for what a curator is expected to do in this day and age. And I mean, I think that this is why a lot of people prefer, well, ha sometimes do, there was a trend where people said organized for a long time, and some people still do. Um, but I almost think that, um, I almost think that uh, terms of identity are all very problematic, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> having to do with gender, having to do with race, having to do with nationality, you know, any of these terms like, you know, I am an American. You know, someone is an Israeli. Do these like are these someone is a woman? <laughs> are these things so clear? You know, um, so I, in some ways, I think that the the word curator can be helpful to be used to sort of reference its history of use, but also to 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 raise the potential of it being opened up to have multiple meanings. Um, so it's I guess to me, I would agree to some extent with Nato Thompson. That in, in the way that like the term like you know artist versus curator for me is less important than the way that the work <coughs> functions, the way that the relationship functions, the way that the um, the culture itself develops. <laughs> מתעסק ביחסים בין עוצר לבין אומן, כאשר אנחנו מגלמים הרבה תערכות וכולם תערכות גדולות, והקונפליקטים שם הם בעיקר אה, בהיבט היותר רחב ממוסד, זאת אומרת, איך עוצר, שהוא הדמות המקצועית ביותר בתוך אה, אה, במוסד, להתמודד עם המנכ"ל ועם היושב ראש ועם ועד מנהל ועם ועדה אקדמית ועם נותני החסות ועם התורמים ועם אה, מערך השיווקי המגבלות ואיך עובדים מולם ועדיין שומרים על עצמאות ועדיין מעבירים את המסר ומנגישים את מה שאתה רוצה להעביר ומה שרוצה להעביר שם הדברים וזה מתחילים במעורבויות ומעורבות ביחד בקביעת התכנים אנחנו נעשה, לא יודע, תערוכה על חלל או נעשה תערוכה על ארכימדס וזה ממשיך בגיוס הכספים, ההשפעה בגודל של השלט של נותני החסות בתוך התערוכה וזה ממשיך בדברים שאתה לא יכול להרים כי אין לך כסף בגלל שזה לא מספיק כלכלי או לא מספיק מושך קהל או לא מספיק דברים כאלה. זה ממשיך בדברים שאתה לפעמים לא יכול להציג בגלל שקהל היעד שלך שונה או לא, או ממה שאתה רוצה להציג בתערוכה. זה ממשיך גם בדברים כמו שהמוזיאון מוציא לשיווק, למשל שם דגש על דברים שאתה לא חושב שהם הספינת הדגל של התערוכה, זאת אומרת, הם מצלמים, אני יודע, את המוצג הזה, שאתה אומר, כי הוא מצטלם טוב יותר ממוצג אחר, אבל הוא לא העיקר של התערוכה, זאת אומרת, 
שלא לדבר האם אני יכול לבחור נושאים שהם לא במישון סטייטמנט של המוזיאון, למשל, אני לא יודע. הזכרת קודם את מיואיק, הייתי שמח לראות את מיואיק במוזיאון, וזה לא קשור למוזיאון מדע. אז הקונפליקטים והמגבלות של עוצר הם הרבה יותר מביחס המשפחתי האישי שבין בזוג עוצר אומן, אלא הם בהיבט הרבה יותר, מלחמה הרבה יותר גדולה.